said? Amen. 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 Well, it is good to be here. I'm excited, and I hope you are excited. I'm still the new guy on staff. <laughs> We've been here now for about 18, 19 days, and I've tonight, uh, today, today, I've introduced myself to a number of people that I introduced myself to last week as well. So forgive me, that is going to happen at least for the next two or three years. But don't be offended by that. I want to continue to get to know all of you and as much as I can. So uh, I'm excited about what God is doing in Arizona through Calvary. So as an outsider, I get to come in and I get to run into people in bashes and run into people at Terribles, which is an awesome name. I get to run into people all over the place and ask them, uh, what do they know about Calvary? And I just hear stories about how God has brought life change through Calvary that people are being introduced to the name of Jesus, some perhaps for the first time. And that's exciting because that, that tells me God is using you, not just the church, not just the pastoral staff, but that God is using you to bring the hope of the gospel that we have. Thank you for your faithfulness to God in that. Today, as we continue our series on the Ten Commandments, the sermon series is called Guardrails. And as we focus on the Ten Commandments, what we're looking for is not the negative of God saying, don't do this, don't do that, but it's the affirmation that we have if we stick with the Ten Commandments and we follow them, they are guardrails for our lives. God desires to bless us and to protect us from doing stupid things. And so we follow the Ten Commandments as we have that relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We follow the Ten Commandments as guardrails in our lives. Tonight, today we'll be reading from Exodus chapter 20. If you do not have a Bible located at the seat in front of you, in the seat in front of you, under the seat in front of you, there is a Bible. If you would take that Bible, turn to page 72. That's where we'll be, begin our reading t today. Have you ever thought about the power of a name? The, the power that's in a name, when you meet somebody for the first time, and maybe you meet somebody that has a, a strange or a particular name, it stands out to you. When we were thinking about naming our children, we have four daughters. When we were thinking about naming our children, I ran to the middle school brain in the back of my head. What I would do is anytime we would think about a girl's name, I would go ask that middle school boy that lives inside my head, can you make up a rhyme with this name? And if it rhymed with a body part, it was out. And if it, was, if it rhymed with something that a body could do, it was out. And so I had that very simple rule. Uh, for instance, uh, I was, you know, in middle school, I was Joe Schmo, you know, or Joe Blow, or Toe Joe, or Joe Donna Pugh, Mojo Jojo, Joe the Ho. I was all those things. <laughs> People could take my name, and Joe just rhymes with a lots and lots of silly things. I had a little easier than my brother. My brother's name was Pat. So he was called Fat Pat, Pat the Cat, Fatty Patty. He was called Peppermint Patty. You know, all those names. So that's why we named my daughter Sophia, Violet, Jesse, and Naomi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I knew she had a name. <laughs> Try to rhyme something weird with those names. You can't do it. So that was a simple guide that I had to help me protect my kids in middle school. Today, as we discuss the third commandment, we'll look at Exodus chapter 27. God says a lot about his name. And we're going to look at Exodus 27. God said to Moses, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. What does it mean to take the Lord's name in vain? In the Hebrew culture, names communicated and really insinuated nature and character of the individual. To take the name of God in vain is to do or say anything, to do or say anything that would make God appear worthless, as though he had little value. We hear God's name taken in vain all the time, don't we? I, I mean, we, we know that God's name is taken in vain all the time. We see it if you ever text and you text the word OMG or text the initials OMG. For the most part, that's taking God's name in vain. That's a, that's a perfect example of, oh my God. 
Now, some would say it's, oh my gosh, well then just say gosh. You don't have to leave the OMG hang out there. Or maybe it's an expression, uh, oh my God, here we go again. You know, my grandmother would say something like that. Oh God, here we go again. Or maybe it's to support a claim. We, we hear people will say something, they'll make a, a, a statement and say, I swear to God, it's true. Swear to God, it's true. You ever heard that? Okay. Or, or maybe we use it lightly. In the South, and, and I understand, some of what I say you may not understand. <laughs> Christy, tonight, she was telling me a story. She's teaching kindergarten at Calvary Christian Academy, and she said to her kindergartners, what'd you need? What'd you need? Which is, what do you need? To the articulate speaking crew of people and her kindergartners looked at her like she was crazy what you need and finally one of them said katie she had no idea what she was asking her she was she thought is she asking me my name i don't know what she's saying but in the south when somebody would turn 40 you might hear the expression lordy lordy look who's 40. you ever heard that has anybody ever heard that okay Preachers sometimes use God's name in vain as a filler word in a prayer. I don't know, maybe you've been guilty of this. I, I know I certainly have. As I'm praying, I say, and Father, would you just, and Father, Father, you know, Father, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, would you Father, and Father, Father, would you Father, 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 Father. So we throw the name of God in our prayers as a filler word, but what we're really doing is using his name in vain, and then, of course, using God's name as a curse word that we're all familiar with. Uh, saying the name of God followed by D-A-M-N or, or taking the name Jesus Christ and turning it into a swear word where we're, where we're shouting and yelling his name as a manner of cursing. That's the most obvious way that the Lord is, Lord's name is taken in vain. But not only is it about our speech and not only is it what we say, but it's also in how we live our lives is, our, is a way that we can take the Lord's name in vain. God desires that his name be kept holy and used for holy things. He desires that we set apart his name as the name above all names, that his name has great significance. When we sin, we, when we say anything that makes him appear worthless. And it's also when we do things that make God appear worthless. 1 Peter 4, 16, Peter wrote, he said, However... If you suffer for being a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God because you bear his name. Now think about that for just a moment. We bear his name, that where we go, the people that we interact with, we are bearing the name of Jesus. Now, as an illustration, if you think about a football player, for instance, a football player does something boneheaded, does something stupid, the coach may grab the football player if he's wearing the jersey and say, you stand for something bigger than that. You represent something bigger than that. You represent your team. You represent the school. You represent something bigger than you. So stop doing that stuff. If I wear a Calvary shirt and I go into to, to the grocery store and I chew out somebody in the checkout lane, right? If I chew out somebody, I am uh, communicating to them. This is what Calvary's like. I'm representing to that individual and to the, all those who are around who would hear me. That's what I'm that's what I'm communicating. This is what Calvary is like. Bearing the name of Jesus is very, very similar. If I live in such a way that makes it appear as though the life change that I experienced when I was 18 years old, when I was saved, when I was born again, when I was forgiven for my sins, if I live in such a way among people that makes the life change I experienced in Jesus worthless or appear worthless i've taken his name in vain now now follow me okay raise your hand if you would humor me if you don't want to raise your hand if you have ever noticed a follower of jesus speak harshly to a customer service representative on the phone raise your hand if you've ever now i'm not saying you okay i'm not saying you and i'm not saying your spouse so don't be elbowing your spouse during this time but if you've ever noticed a follower of Jesus speak harshly, raise your hand if you've ever a note, noticed a follower of Jesus tip poorly after receiving bad service. All right. Raise your hand if you've ever noticed a follower of Jesus speak rudely to their children or spouse in public. Raise your hand if you've ever noticed a follower of Jesus in traffic cut somebody off <laughs> and then do the one finger wave. 
Raise your hand if you would join me in admitting guilt to some of those things. Right. And you know, in each and every one of those examples, sadly, that's a clear example of me. That's a clear example of us taking the Lord's name in vain because we bear his name. We bear his name. You might argue, Joe, go easy on yourself. The people around you do not know that you bear the name of Jesus. And I would say this, if the people around me that I interact with on a regular basis don't know that I bear the name of Jesus, then I am taking the Lord's name in vain because they don't know that I bear the name of Jesus. They don't know that I am following God with my heart and my life. And if those individuals that I interact with on a regular basis can't see Jesus in me, I'm living my life in vain. But I thank God for second chances, don't you? That's right. I mean, we've all been there. We've all taken the Lord's name in vain in some way, whether it's what we say or whether it's what we do. And we thank God that he forgives us and he loves us. So the, the next question is this. Why do we misuse the name, of the, uh, the name of God? Why do we do that? Why do we misuse God's name? Now, I don't think that followers of Jesus intentionally rub their hands and they say, I am going to misuse the name of God today. But it happens. Why do we do that? Well, I think that we forget sometimes. We forget about the power that is associated with the name of God. You know, when God rescued the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, he told Moses, do you remember when, when God rescued the Israelites? And he said to Moses, what, what do I tell them? And God told Moses, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. His name has power. His name would move the Israelites to acceptance that God told Moses to deliver them. When David fought the Philistine giant, he said, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. There is great power associated with the name of the Lord. And when we live our lives without recognizing the power that belongs to the name of God, we take the Lord's name in vain. Remember this, it is in the Lord's name that marriages have been restored. How many of you know somebody whose marriage has been restored because of the power of the Lord's name working in their lives? That's right. Drunks are brought to sobriety through the power of the Lord's name. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that amazing? Addicts are made clean in the power of the name of Jesus. In the Lord's name, lives are changed. Not in the name of Chad, not in the name of Joe, not in the name of Calvary, not in the name of Christianity, but in the name of the Lord, people are delivered and rescued and are saved and begin to follow Jesus and experience forgiveness day in and day out. It's through the Lord's name that genuine life change occurs. There is great power in his name. Now, way before the uh, invention of the printing press, uh, none of you were alive back then, but way before the invention of the printing press, the scribes would translate the Old Testament and they would take a copy of the, uh, uh, of the Bible and they would, they would uh, take their quill, dip it in ink, and they would write. And as they would go word for word, writing each line that they were just uh, of, of Scripture down, when they would hit the name of the Lord, and there were many names of the Lord in the Scripture, when they would hit the name of the Lord, they would take, get up, they would go and wash themselves, they might pray, they would get another quill that had not been used, come back, sit down, and write the name of the Lord with that new pen or that new quill. Why did they do that? because they recognized there was great power in the name of God and they humbly, respectfully honored God's name by doing something as quiet as getting up, changing out a pen and coming back and writing down his name. They recognized how set apart, how powerful his name is and they treated the name of God with respect and humility. I would do well to recognize the same power in the name of God today. There's a creative power in the name of God. Colossians 2.17 tells us he is before all things and in him all things hold together. It was Jesus who was there hovering over the waters with the spirit of God and the presence of God as God created the world. There is creative power, explosive creative power in the name of the Lord. There's saving power in the name of the Lord. Romans 10.13 tells us. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And there is great protective power in the name of the Lord as well. 
Proverbs 18.10 tells us that the name of the Lord is a strong fortress. The godly run to him and are safe. There's great power in the name of the Lord. There is so, so, uh, such a presence, a powerful presence of comfort in the name of the Lord. I want to handle God's name with a little more humility and a little more respect and a little more joy and with a little bit of acknowledgement that there is great power in his name. But what's the purpose of a powerful name? What is the purpose of having a powerful name? God desires his followers to call out to him through his name. That's why God has given us the name, his name. That's why God is that relational God that wants to be known. He communicates his name to us so we have a name to call him and call out to him. John 16, 24, Jesus said this about his name. He said, you haven't done this before. Ask using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. See, there is great power in the name of Jesus. God desires that we call out to the name of Jesus because God has given all authority in heaven and under heaven and over earth to the name of Jesus. It's as though God sat back and said, look, from now on, you're going to call out to Jesus. You're going to use the name Jesus. From now on, you're going to call out to him. His name is above every other name. I've given him all authority and all power. Ephesians 1.22 Paul writes, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. Well, all things means all things and that Jesus has authority over it all. God intends for us to call out to him in prayer using the name of the man or the God who has authority over all things. The God man, the mediator, Jesus. He intends for us to call out to him using the name of Jesus, and the name of Jesus is above every other name. Remember what Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 9, as Paul was talking about how great God was, how great Jesus was? He said, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I don't want to be guilty of misusing the name of the Lord anymore. I, I don't want to text or to write OMG to somebody. I don't want to, to speak and act as though I'm making God appear worthless, that he's not the life-changing, all-powerful, loving God that we know that he is. I want to speak more gently and humbly when I refer to the power or to his name because there is none like him. There's no name above the name of Jesus. The Bible had many other names for Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the author of life. He is the beginning and the end. He is the bread of life. The Bible tells us he is the chosen one. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the commander of the Lord's army, that he is your deliverer, he is my deliverer, that he is your great physician, he is my great physician. The Bible tells us he is faithful and true and that he is a friend of sinners. His name is Jesus. He is the image of God. He is the great king. He is the king of kings. He is the king of the ages. He is the king over the whole earth his name is jesus he is the lamb of god he is the light of the world he is the living stone he is the lord of glory he is the lord of lords he is the man of sorrows he is the messiah his name is jesus he is the mighty god he is the perfecter of faith he is the Prince of Peace. He is the one who is and was and is to come. He is the eternal God from ever, from beginning to end, from before the beginning, infinitely. He is God and we bear his name of the mighty one, the warrior, the Lord God, King Jesus. And we are in his family 
We belong to him and we bear his name with everything that we do, say, and think. My prayer is that I would adequately and accurately represent Jesus to a lost and dying world that needs hope, that needs to experience joy, that needs to experience life-changing power of the gospel. We bear his name, folks. I want to live like I know that, and I want God's people to live like they love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let's pray together. Father, tonight as we look at your word and we talk about taking your name in vain, Lord, we know that there are times and there have been moments in our lives when each and every one of us, including the pastor who is standing on this platform right now, has taken your name in vain. That I haven't worshipped you with all my heart and soul as I ought to. That there have been times that I have used your name as a filler word in prayer without acknowledging the powerful presence and the power that your name can bring. That your name delivers, your name rescues, your name restores, your name heals, your name brings hope, your name brings joy, your name brings answers to our prayers. Lord, may I never be guilty of taking the Lord's name in vain again. And I thank you for forgiving me. And Lord, tonight, today as we go out representing Jesus, may we bear your name, the mighty King of kings and the mighty Lord of lords. May we bear your name well and shine the light to a lost and dying world in need of the light of Jesus. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen.